Institute, Avi Ben Lolo. Thanks so much for being on the CJN Daily. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And it's great to have you just as you're about to head to New York to have an event at the United Nations. So let's start with that. Can you walk us through what's that for and you know what is going, what's the program going to be? Yeah, well, the Abraham Global Peace Initiative is a Canadian organization that is really outward looking and it's, it's, it's global in, in nature. And so, of course, the most fitting place for us uh, to start off is the United Nations. And even despite the fact that sometimes, you know, there's friction uh, there, it's exactly why we exist. It's in order to meet with, uh, with as many leaders as possible and start a conversation and hopefully uh, press for changes. Um, you know, next week um, is an important week for us. Uh, we are actually going to be bestowing our first ever uh, human rights award on our own permanent uh, ambassador to the UN, uh, Ambassador Bob Ray. Uh, who has uh, done incredible things uh, for our country and internationally when it comes to human rights. So as a starting point, we're going to be doing that, meeting with him and his uh, colleagues at Canada's uh, mission, and then, of course, meeting with various ambassadors uh, along the way uh, throughout the day, and as well, uh, meeting with um, organizations like uh, UNRWA and uh, the Human Rights uh, Commission, uh, the senior executives there. Well, you bring up very important points that Jewish people, of course, and Canadian Jews uh, watch, which is, of course, the whole anti-Israel slant. Uh, some people call it an obsession at the United Nations. So uh, what do you hope to accomplish in this type of body where, you know, other groups, other people have not succeeded before? Even Israel hasn't succeeded in, in changing that. Yeah, and that, that's an excellent question. And I think we can accomplish a lot. We can move the, the needle a lot because our positioning as an organization is completely different than what's been done before. So um, firstly and foremost, uh, we're a Canadian organization and 100% Canadian. We all know that Canada has a great brand internationally. We're a trusted nation. We're seen as a, a nation that is a human rights, peacemaking, advocacy uh, type of uh, 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 country that, that promotes that. And countries trust us. And we, we've done that research. And in fact, when you think about, about it, you know, Companies like Canada Goose, for example, or Roots or others have utilized the, the Canada brand very successfully. So why are we not utilizing the Canada brand um, to push forward policy internationally? Why are we shy about it as Canadians? And in fact, when you think about it, Canadians have generally been run by, if I should say, American type uh, institutions that have come here and have told us what, what to do. Whereas in fact, we're going, we're standing on our two feet and we're saying, you know what, we're international, we're respected globally and we're going to make a difference by, by pushing the buttons at the United Nations, at the International Criminal Court, at the OSCE, at UNESCO, at UNRWA, at all of the, uh, all of the global organizations that, as you, you mentioned, uh, may have some biases and to try to bring back a, a fair a balanced uh, approach that one is truthful when it comes to Israel and truthful when it comes to human rights. And I can expand on that if you'd like. Well, I was going to say with UNRWA or with UNESCO, even now that they're, you know, considering putting, they have some of the world's worst offenders on these, you know, women's councils or human rights councils. A lot of people think the UN, well, Stephen Harper even thought that the UN was not worth the money that was, you know, Canada was investing in it. Um, and Canada, you said Canada's, so let's talk about that first, Canada's brand, except that the UN Security Council didn't give Canada the seat. They gave it to another country, despite Justin Trudeau's um, huge efforts last time around. Uh, why should we even engage with these people when we know they don't want to hear this balanced view or even this pro-Israel view? Yeah, so I, I actually tend to disagree with that point of view, and it comes, um, it comes back to my own uh, experiences uh, historically. Um, you know, sometimes in our community, we, we have a very, um, you know, a, a little bit of a closed minded mentality, not wanting to engage uh, outwards and, and try to inspire uh, change. And my own um, history working with um, uh, politicians, with uh, police, with, um, um, you know, governmental organizations is that, uh, and by the way, and I should add to that multi-faith groups, I have a lot of 
um, faith groups involved with my foundation um, and with me, you know, who are my friends. And, and so in every, almost every single situation where I've engaged in that way and put my foot forward and gone out and met with, with, with people who you would think, you know, would be far different. Um, it's always led to very, very productive uh, relations where we can make change. And, and that's the approach that I want to take in this, in this particular case. It's that, it's that we live in a, you know, in a global world, um, you know, we can, we can shut ourselves completely off and try to deal with anti-Semitism on our own, all 14 million of us, um, or we can expand our base, um, reach out and find partners. Those partners, as an example, when you, you know, you said, well, well, I deal with, you know, when you look at the Abraham Accords, you know, um, we were inspired by, of course, the Abraham Accords, you know, think about the incredible success that we are now seeing, um, you know, in the Middle East and, and as a result of that internationally. And that is because of engagement. That is because people to people. And this is what we are doing, people to people. And despite the fact that we're, we might be at odds with the United Nations, I've already had quite a number of interactions uh, with very high level uh, um, operators at the UN who are willing to engage, willing to talk, and possibly willing to, you know, um, to work on, on policy changes. So why not? And I don't think it's going to be in five minutes. I, I want to add to this. I don't think, you know, this is not a, you know, there's no magic to this. This is going to be a long, long runway. And that's our vision. It's, it's you know, five, 10 years, you know, we can't make policy changes in two minutes. But we can start building, you know, very important relationships that will lead to those changes. So what you're saying is perhaps the UN is just an excuse to do the side talks and the corridor conversations and the engagement in a one on one, as opposed to, you know, fighting it out um, with resolutions, which is the, the diplomats have to do that. But you have a role behind the scenes. Is that what I'm hearing? I mean, it's, it's multi Look, I mean, we know that, for example, the UN General Assembly, if you see it, Israel just, but well, I mean, why did Israel participate in the, if, if, if Israel sees it that way, but yet Israel participates, um, you know, and so, and so, of course, there's side discussions, you know, Prime Minister Bennett had side discussions, that's what happens at the UN, the, the real work happens on the side with policymakers and in the hallways and, and so forth. And that, that's what we're doing. And the truth of the matter is the real operators, the real people who are every day on the ground. You know, if you think of UNRWA, so we met with the overall director of education of UNRWA. Think about it. He's in charge of half a million students um, throughout the Middle East and Jordan and Lebanon and Syria. We suddenly have access to, potentially have access to half a million students in these places. And we, you know, in the long term, possibly could, um, you know, facilitate some kind of change. I don't know yet, and I don't have all the answers, but um, through that kind of dialogue, um, it's so integral to what we can do to really move the needle. Why should we continue doing what we've been doing all of these years? It's clearly not working. Let's, let's try something different. All right. So how will this be different, do you think, or how will your approach um, perhaps succeed where, you know, when you were with Wiesenthal or B'nai Bris, and I'm not singling them out, and it, there's no order there, or, you know, even your colleague uh, Erwin Kotler's approaches um, may or may not be working. Like, why is yours different than all the other ones that have been working in the same human rights field? Yeah, so no, as, I, as I've already alluded, first of all, um, you know, um, there haven't been, and you know, I don't, every organization is worthy and, and uh, there's no one that is, uh, you know, everybody is contributing, um, you know, very, in a very important way uh, to, to this work. But, um, you know, fundamentally speaking, um, there hasn't been this kind of international approach. In fact, the spirit in Canada, if you think about it, um, you know, we don't have very, very many think tanks in this country. If you go to Washington, D.C., every second office is a think tank, okay? Every, everywhere is a think tank. Here in Canada, you can count them on one, maybe one and a half hands. 
um, how many think tanks there are, and none of them are are, are mostly independent NGOs like like we are. So what we're trying to do is build something really unique, um, you know, from a human rights point of view. Um, not just, by the way, I should say, not just for the Jewish community, but for for Canada um, itself, and that's what makes this really special. When you look at our board members. We have now levels, we have uh, directors, uh, we have a national board of advisors, and we have a global board. Um, there's quite a substantial number of board members who are not from the Jewish community. And this is actually very different um, from a, a, what you would, you would think of a you know, standard Jewish organization where all the, the letterhead is comprised of, 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 you know, of Jewish people. So all of a sudden you have a situation here where you have an organization with key Canadian leaders, leaders like Bill Blair and Peter McKay and Stockwell Day um, and David Onley and Tony Comper we just added. And, 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 you know, and suddenly, you know, when, when, when um, an organization like, um, well, I won't mention organizations, but um, when there is an organization on the world stage that condemns Israel and calls it an apartheid state or, or calls, um, you know, or says it's committing war crimes, and all of a sudden you have a letter from an organization like ours that, that you know, is comprised of, you know, strong Canadian leaders of many different uh, from different walks of life. It's a completely different messaging um, that 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 now it's not just this Jewish organization. Of course, a Jewish organization is going to protest. Of course, but here you have an organization that is values based, that is truth based, that that is anti bias, um, that it that, that is saying you know let's let's talk about the truth. So um, there you have it. Hopefully that answers your, your, your question. I'm sorry about all the beeps. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's COVID. We have to just, you know, whatever. We move on. I, I want to ask you, you, you said it's not just Jewish and not just Jewish people. And of course, your group is supposed to be mostly about human rights in general and not just about Jewish issues, but majority is. Uh, of the issues that are keeping you up at night, what are the top three? Is it Iran? Is it campus anti-Semitism? What are the top three issues that you are really, you know, worried about? Listen, having having uh, been on the front lines this past May with, um, you know, here in Toronto uh, um, when the war took place at Gaza, um, you know, I was a few leaders who who spoke out quite profusely and published almost on the hour myths and facts and trying to correct the rhetoric. And I was the only Jewish leader who, who stood up on a stage at Mel Asman Square at a, at a pro-Israel rally speaking out. And, and um, when you say to me, um, you know, what, what keeps me up at night, it's what I saw, okay? It's, 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 it's the fear, first of all, in the Jewish community, and secondly, the assaults against the Jewish community that were on our streets. And those same assaults were also in American streets and in European streets. And so, um, you know, uh, um, it, it was around the world. And so um, that keeps me up at night. What is our the future, first of all, of our community in, in, in this country, given what happened and given the silence around it and the systematic anti-Semitism that entered into um, normal sphere into companies and organizations. I had um, professionals, uh, not, you know, teachers and, and people who work at aid societies, like normal people that you would think, you know, are, you know, these are, you know, and, and, and lawyers working in law firms and, and people working in companies who, who called me up and said, Avi, there's, um, you know, I'm feeling, um, you know, that there's anti-Semitism in my organization. That, that is a dangerous thing. And, and that is um, um, for us. And so the next flare up, what will it be like? Because each flare up will be worse and worse and worse. So, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very worried about the next decade um, when it comes to anti-Semitism. And I think we are dealing with an urgent situation. We cannot fall asleep. And, and that's what, you know, I, I try to, you know, try to focus on, on every single day. Um, the, and, you know, see my article in the National Post tomorrow with uh, Senator Grafstein on the audacity of anti-Semitism. Um, so that, that's um, 
uh, that, that's one. Two is obviously the defamation of, of Israel, which is, um, you know, continues to be a, a you know, source uh, of both anti-Semitism, but also, you know, people trying to, um, you know, uh, bring Israel to, to its knees. They're not going to succeed. Israel is very strong, but um, that is still, um, you know, very much uh, weighing on, on my mind. And, you know, I could share examples about that. And obviously, in, in, in a bigger sense as well, um, you know, the turmoil in the world, um, anti-human um, rights issues, um, you know, we, you know, the, the world is, is worse than ever. Um, you know, we are really in a fragile uh, situation when you look at the conflicts, you look at, you know, things like just happened um, in Afghanistan and um, the treatment of women, you know, in Afghanistan and, and, and what that's going to mean. And we've written about that. Um, you know, uh, the Uyghurs and, you know, let's not forget them and uh, no one's mentioned them for a long time. And so, you know, as an organization, as a Canadian human rights organization, it, it does us also service when we talk about other things, other human rights issues, not just our own issues. And as an organization that is comprised of, as I said to you before, all of these leaders, um, you know, this is this is important. So it really does make us unique in that way. Okay, I've got two more questions. The first is about you're having an anti-Semitism summit um, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in November, um, a global anti-Semitism summit. Canada had one in uh, in July as a response to those attacks that you were just mentioning uh, from the May hostilities. Um, yours has, you know, obviously not a, a Canadian little uh, focus. Yours is a much broader. Uh, sp speakers and, and much broader world focus. Uh, what do you hope that that will accomplish that the Canadian government's one did not? Well, as you, as you rightly pointed out, number one is the Canadian government is the Canadian government and, and they, they had a unique slant to it and, and they included who they wanted to and, the, you know, and, and so forth. So, so, you know, kudos to them, but you know, we are, uh, again, we are a global organization. So, so our footprint, in fact, in our expanse, uh, you know, in the next three to five years, you know, um, we are, we're building a global footprint from a Canadian perspective. And so, um, you know, we, we aim to inspire uh, the world. We don't, you know, even though we're, we're operating from Canada, nothing here, nothing is, is just, you know, physically uh, geographical. We, um, you know, uh, all of our speakers at the conference are, uh, you know, hail from international places. And really the only thing that's limiting us, we can have many more. It's just the only thing that's limiting us is, is the amount of time that we can, we can dedicate. Um, so, so, you know, our aim is to obviously educate uh, the public. And when I say the public is, of course, not just our Canadian constituents, not just you know, but we are reaching, um, you know, into the world and our aim, including, by the way, we have educational programs that we're building. We're building a whole human rights educational institute. It's going to be a speaker time. tonight, even, I think, right? A speaker yeah, a speaker tonight. Tonight. yeah, you know, so as part of that, so, you know, we're only three months old. So, so, you know, it's going to take us a little bit of time, but um, you know, the, the Institute will, in fact, when it's in full gear, um, you know, aims to have um, educational lectures around around the world and bring in so you can have teacher training programs, as an example, you know, with teachers in, I don't care, from Bangladesh or Australia or, you know, wherever, wherever it is, it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference, okay, because we now with new technologies, we can have an impact and we can reach more, more people and we can bring them in into our training programs and as ambassadors and, um, and let them be part of our network. We've already actually started that. We have people in Ireland, as an example, who are working with us on curriculum development. The UN is working on it with us on curriculum development. And, um, you know, and, and through that process, we have people in Kenya. So, you know, through that process, um, we are going to expand. But again, everything is, is just a matter of time and building blocks. Okay. Um, you didn't mention Iran, but you've written about it. And the, oh, I write about Iran all it, the time. So. Then it spoke about it, but that's not keeping you up at night. You're not that worried. Uh, you said the top two. So I was just wondering if that was something our audience should know about. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I write about Iran. I mentioned them almost in almost in every article that I that I write. Um, uh, and so, you know, of course, Iran keeps uh, me up at night. And, you know, I'm 
con continuous educator and advocate uh, against Iran because I think people, you know, are, are falling asleep once again at the wheel. Um, this is a very dangerous uh, regime, as we all know. Um, they are trying to create a, a, an umbrella in the Middle East that is um, under their control. They already, in a way, have already created it, um, where you're, you're seeing Syria, now Lebanon, Yemen, um, obviously Gaza, um, you know, under the Iranian influence. And, and, and that is growing. And then, of course, um, you know, they are going to get the bomb. Um, you know, they're, they're just not, they're not abiding by, they don't want to negotiate with JCPOA. Um, and they're running towards the bomb as quickly as possible. So um, this is, this is very dangerous. Um, coupled with that, of course, is their anti-Semitism and their threat against Israel. Um, uh, you know, they already have uh, uh, people on Israel's borders in, in the Golan and in Lebanon and obviously in Syria. So um, this, there is already, in a way, a war of attrition, so to speak, uh, going on between Israel and Iran. And so, and so um, you know, this should be a concern. And I say this as well, I think it's important that when we talk about these things, we don't just talk about them from just an Israel or Jewish perspective. I think we should talk about it from a global human rights perspective, which is a point as well that we often miss, which is this is important to Canada. Don't forget, Iran shot down a plane um, with some 56 Canadians on it. This is relevant. This is not, you know, and, and so and so I keep reminding uh, Canadians that this is important to them, um, you know, and it's important global, uh, you know, to global players in terms of the instability that that um, they are, um, you know, they're projecting internationally. So, yes, the answer to your question is, Iran plays heavily on my mind too. Right. I know your thing is blowing up. So I have one last thing that we have Sorry, to talk Sorry, I, I apologize. Oh, no, it's good. I can edit it. It's fine. And I'll just say, you know, if you hear beeps, it's because he's busy. <laughs> Look, um, you mentioned some of the other organizations. I, we all know that, uh, you know, you were with Simon Wiesenthal for 20 years. Um, you haven't really spoken out about the fact of your departure. So on social media, there's a lot of negative reviews about what happened from employees there. Are, are you aware of that? And, and do you have any thoughts about you know, telling what happened and why you left. Well, this is this is not an area that I can uh, comment on. As uh, you know, we have um, you know various. Uh, we have an NDA, and uh, unfortunately, uh, there is uh, nothing more that I could uh, add to uh, to that. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I think I think I think the public should look at. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, I have a very substantial following, a very substantial group of people who are behind me, including police and uh, politicians and, and um, you know, uh, and I think that they should, they should look at that and, and, and understand the truth and the reality, uh, you know, and take from that, um, you know, what is, what, what, what is true and, and uh, the people that are around me that know me very, very well um you know uh you know when you have when you have uh, uh people of that caliber behind you um who know you well who've uh you know who've traveled with you who've seen with their own eyes uh everything um i think it should speak for itself i don't need to add any more to that all right appreciate you uh weighing in on that and um you know, we'll look forward to more uh, your Friday news newsletters and um, your UN uh, your UN uh, event and the gala next May, the official launch. So, congratulations again uh, on on this new venture, and um, thank you again for being here on the CJN Daily. Well, thank you very much for having me.